So hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Jacob Berendes. I'm at Harvard University. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a new formulation of quantum theory. Uh, this is uh, an ambitious talk, so I want to get started. We're going we're gonna to move uh, fairly quickly. OK, so the structure of this talk, I'm going to start with some motivation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory of stochastic processes, which will be a major part of this talk. Uh, then I'll uh, connect this up with Hilbert space pictures and Hilbert space formulation. Uh, and um, and this will be the heart of what I'm going to try to explain in the talk is the correspondence between these two pictures. Um, then I'll talk a little more about dynamics, in particular about Krasty compositions, which I'll define. And then I'll talk about uh, unitarity and its emergence. And I'll talk about uh, interference, how that shows up in this formalism. I'll talk about decoherence, and I'll introduce the notion of a division event. I'll talk about entanglement. Uh, then we'll talk about the measurement process, measuring devices, and I'll introduce the notion of an emergible. And then we'll have time for discussion. Okay, so motivation, or why should you care about any of this? All right, so I, I probably don't have to convince many of you here that there are problems with the textbook Dirac von Neumann axioms for quantum theory. They're abstract, they're highly complicated, but you know, more to the point, they're ultimately incomplete. They depend in a fundamental way on notions like measurements that are not defined by the axioms themselves. And this issue leads directly to the measurement problem. Yeah, there are many ways to formulate this, and there are different variants of it, but the one I'll be using is the measurement axioms, the Born rule, and wave function collapse don't unambiguously specify which systems can act as measuring devices. So on the one hand, applying wave function collapse breaks unitarity, uh, and that means deciding whether or not to apply it can make an empirical difference. And this ambiguity is pressing uh, now that we you know, are developing the technology to, to develop mesoscopic scale devices. On the other hand, trying to drop the measurement axioms makes it difficult to see how to get definite outcomes or probabilities out of quantum theory. It's instructive to uh, line up the measurement problem with another very important uh, problem in theoretical physics, the black hole information loss problem. They're both decades old problems. They both, uh, at least superficially, look like a violation of unitarity. They're both very hard to study empirically in the lab. Uh, they both affect a theory that may be part of quantum gravity. Um, both of them have at times generated wild metaphysical speculations. Uh, both have produced very interesting spin-off results. Uh, I should mention that the measurement problem, or at least attempts to understand it better, have led to at least one Nobel Prize in recent years. No Nobel Prizes quite yet for black hole information loss, but maybe someday. Um, so, you know, your reaction to, uh, you know, the measurement problem, the measurement axioms, um, and this whole problem of interpreting quantum theory might be to try to assign a physical meaning directly to the ingredients of Hilbert spaces. Um, but the one reason to be skeptical of this is that quantum theory contains a relatively unrecognized form of gauge invariance. Uh, if you let V of T be any time-dependent unitary operator, the following gauge transformation leaves all the empirical predictions of textbook quantum theory invariant. So we transform the state vectors of wave functions by acting with V of T. Density matrices and observables transform by similarity or conjugation transformations by, by V. Uh, the time evolution operator of the system uh, transforms as a so-called correlator. Um, and so you'll notice that it contains a, a time t equals zero on, on that right factor of V dagger. Uh, that you need that in order for the predictions to be invariant. And if you uh, figure out what this means for the Hamiltonian, you find the Hamiltonian transforms just like a non-abelian gauge potential. So this was first, the first uh, example I ever found of this being carefully defined was in a paper by Harvey Brown in 1999. Um, and you know the interpretation here is, if you think of uh, taking the system's Hilbert space and fibering it over a one-dimensional manifold parametrized by the system's time, uh, then, you know, a time evolving state vector is a section on that fiber bundle. And this unitary local and time unitary transformation is independently, unitarily rotating each of the Hilbert space fibers independently. So it really is a gauge transformation in the mathematical sense. Uh, and then the time evolution operator is really a correlator between Hilbert space fibers and the Hamiltonian is a connection. It's a flat connection. That means that you can gauge transform to any uh, Hamiltonian that you want. In particular, um, it means that all the ingredients of the Hilbert space picture are gauge uh, dependent, uh, and that makes their physical meaning highly suspect. In particular, you can use this to map any state vector trajectory in the Hilbert space to essentially any other state vector trajectory, which casts doubt on, on taking it seriously as containing gauge invariant physical content. Okay, so another motivation, and this is an analogy from history. So in replacing Ptolemy's instrumentalist model of the universe, which one could regard as just like an instrumentalist mathematical uh, um, me mechanism for making predictions about observations of planets with all the epicycles on epicycles, you know, in replacing that with, you know, the Keplerian, Copernican, Galilean uh, picture, it wasn't just a simplification. 
Um, it also provided a, a clear physical picture, actual bodies moving in space. It would be improvement on the Dirac von Neumann axioms if we could do the same thing for quantum theory. And I would argue that there isn't another Copernican principle. We all know the Copernican principle that if your theory is telling you that you are located in a special place in the universe, maybe you've made a mistake. But I would argue the other Copernican principle is that, yeah, instrumentalist uh, um, theoretical frameworks are useful, but we shouldn't settle for them. We shouldn't settle for them forever. Getting the physical picture right really matters, even if it takes centuries to see why. I mean, maybe Galileo couldn't have imagined it, but you know, today we can build rocket ships and go into space and visit those orbs. And that wouldn't have been possible if we'd been using the Ptolemaic uh, system. All right, so there's another motivation, uh, a somewhat more practical motivation. So when modeling a real world macroscopic system, you know, this could be a turbulent system, a biological system, uh, systems in social science, finance, that behaves probabilistically, one often uses the theory of stochastic processes. I'll describe that in a little more detail later. This comes from the Greek stokos or stochastikos for aim or guess. Uh, in, in modeling systems like this, one often resorts to various simplifying approximations to make these models tractable. So a big one is the Markov approximation, which I'll define in more detail later, and also a little less well-known is divisibility. Again, I'll define those in a moment. I'm going to show in this talk that there exists a highly useful formalism for modeling stochastic processes without making these approximations. There's like an analytical mechanics, uh, a, a, a general framework for being able to model stochastic processes without those approximations that's been waiting for us all this time. And this formalism will actually turn to be quantum theory itself. And this potentially opens up uh, a whole new application for quantum computers and maybe in the shorter term quantum simulators as an efficient tool for simulating generic stochastic processes. Identifying and removing hidden assumptions is often a key step toward discovering new science. And we'll see that avoiding the assumption of a Markov or divisibility approximation will be crucial for deriving quantum theory. So then another, said another way, non-Markovianity, indivisibility, seem to have been the key missing pieces, the secret sauce for obtaining a physical picture. And that's why arguably earlier efforts like the Fenys nelson stochastic approach to quantum mechanics didn't ultimately pan out. And indeed, there's been a lot of work in recent years suggesting that quantum theory is fundamentally non-Markovian. Uh, just as an example, a paper from a few years ago by Lincoln and Dami. So we'll need to review how standalone probabilities, joint probabilities, conditional probabilities, and marginalization work. So if P of E is a standalone probability of some proposition E, P of F is the same thing for some proposition F, P of E and F is the joint probability, P of E vertical line, or P of E given F is the conditional probability of E given F. Um, there's a, a simple factorization relationship between joint probabilities, conditional probabilities, and standalone probabilities given by this formula here. Uh, and there's a notion of marginalization. If you take joint probabilities and sum over the possible values of one of the propositions, uh, then you end up with a standalone probability for the other. If we insert this factorization relation into this, uh, into this marginalization formula, we get the marginalization formula in this form. So the standalone probability of E can be obtained by taking the standalone probability of F, multiplying by the conditional probability of E given F, and then summing over F. This will be an important formula in our work ahead. So just signpost it, that. we'll need that. Okay, now this talk is not going to be limited to any specific kind of quantum system. When I say quantum theory, I mean quantum theory quite broadly, not the quantum mechanics of particles. Um, but I will find it useful here to talk about a, a single particle thought experiment. It'll be a good invitation uh, motivating why we should be thinking about non-Markovian indivisible stochastic dynamics in the first place. So we're going to consider the double slit experiment. And in this experiment, one imagines sending particles one at a time toward a wall with two slits, then observing where the particle arrives on a projection screen. So here's a schematic picture of the diagram. The slits will assume are very close together. Let's let A, broadly speaking, denote various possible starting conditions. B, denote which slit the particle goes through and see where it lands. So the usual classical assumption is that the conditional probability, P of B given A, which slit it enters given initial conditions, times P of C given B, where it lands given which slit. If you multiply those together and sum over which slit, you get the conditional probability of C given A, where it lands given its initial conditions. But it's important to note that this formula does not follow from the general marginalization rules. It is not a mathematical identity. It implicitly requires making a Markovian or divisibility assumption. This is an implicit assumption that's um, uh, been lurking there. Um, this predicts the following pattern over many repetitions. If you make that assumption, then over many repetitions, you get a histogram that looks a little bit like this. And just a note, this is a blend of two distributions. You get like two uh, uh, bump-like distributions from the two holes. And if the holes are close together, they merge into, into this distribution here. And indeed, this matches observations from macroscopic particles like stones. 
For an electron or photon, by contrast, one instead observes what looks like an interference pattern. This is what the histogram looks like. Distinct locations where the probability of the particle landing is very, very small and other places where it's very, very high. But does this mean that the particle is really a wave or that the particle somehow goes through both slits on each run of the experiment? Well, I'm gonna show in this talk that one can account for this pattern merely by allowing the dynamics to be non-Markovian or indivisible. That is, I'm not gonna make this assumption. I'm gonna allow this relation, which, you know, from a, a purely mathematical or, or uh, you know, fundamental standpoint, one has to justify, I'm, I'm gonna drop it. And we're gonna see that we can get the same results without it, which is um, surprising, but, but very interesting. All right, now let me talk about the theory of stochastic processes a little bit. So we're going to take uh, our basic model for a system described by this theory of stochastic processes to have the following kinematical axiom. That means what its configurations are. Uh, every system in this framework will have a configuration. It'll be denoted by Latin letters, I, J, and so forth, running from 1 to N in some configuration space. Uh, composite systems and their subsystems will be defined by Cartesian products, just like in classical physics. By the way, I'm going to use a discrete no uh, notation here for the configurations, I labeled one through N, but keep in mind N could be countably or uncountably infinite. You have to replace summations with integrals, probabilities with probability densities, and so forth. But it'll make the notation too complicated, and also I don't have a lot of time. All right, so just a reminder of X and Y are sets. Their Cartesian product, X cross Y, is just the set of all the ordered pairs, little x comma little y, for a little x and little y belonging to those two sets. And so what we're saying here is that if you have a subsystem A with configuration I subscript A and a subsystem B with configurations I subscript B, then the composite system AB has configuration given by the ordered pair. That's all we mean, just ordered pairs of configurations like you would do classically. The dynamical axiom for these uh, systems are going to consist of the assumption, the axiom, the posit, that there exists to a suitable level of approximation, well-defined conditional probabilities, uh, gamma sub I, J of T. These are conditional probabilities for the system to be in its ith configuration at t, given that it is in its jth configuration at some initial time t equals zero. Now, in a little bit, I'm going to explain why t equals zero is not a special or unique time, but for now, we're going to be uh, assuming some initial time t equals zero. And that's stop. That's it. Those are the physical axioms, a kinematical axiom and a dynamical axiom. I should just make a note here um, that uh, the stochastic probability of uh, conditional probabilities here um, it can, if you if you wish, you can model a deterministic system with them by uh, degenerating them to uh, trivial probabilities of one and zero. So this is actually more general than uh, deterministic dynamics. So we have just two axioms now. The kinematical axiom identifies the physical stuff, the configurations, although it will depend on what system you want to model. This isn't going to give us the answer about what the fundamental configurations of all the universe are. Like in classical physics, you propose a model and you have to pick the configuration space. The dynamical axiom will see treats closed and open systems quite equitably and neatly generalizes classical deterministic time evolution to the probabilistic stochastic case. But keep in mind, the metaphysical level behind all of this formalism, there is just a system with an underlying configuration evolving through time along some trajectory that we don't know in a configuration space. But we lack uh, you know, a framework to say definitively, deterministically what that trajectory is. And that's why we're resorting to these conditional probabilities. The claim is that one can derive all of quantum theory in general from these physical axioms via a set of mathematical identities and theorems, together with some standard choices of composite systems and stochastic dynamics. Now, although the physical axioms here are simple, uh, one of the tasks that we have to do is rederive the whole formalism of quantum theory. Quantum theory is complicated and it will take many steps. And this is akin to asking a Copernican with a simple physical model to account for and derive the whole Ptolemaic system, to persuade a Ptolemaic astronomer that that this really does give an equivalent description, you have to go through this task, uh, even though the goal is not, is not to treat Ptolemaic astronomy as the fundamental thing. Uh, so let's get started. All right, so we have a standalone probability distribution at the initial time, and these are probabilities. They're not negative, they sum to one. And we assume a standalone probability, uh, we're going to try to study standalone probability distribution at a later time t. Uh, and I should say later or earlier, I actually haven't specified whether t has to be bigger than or equal to zero. I'm not making at this point any time asymmetric assumptions. So these standalone probabilities are linear related by the conditional probabilities according to that marginalization formula that I told you to, to look out for earlier. Importantly, this is a linear relationship. You can stick in arbitrary choices of initial standalone probabilities. Those are freely adjustable. And then the dynamical conditional probabilities tell you what the standalone probabilities are at the other time t. One says that these conditional probabilities describe a stochastic process. And this is how we begin the discussion of stochastic processes. We can naturally write this in matrix notation. That uh, marginalization formula naturally lends itself to matrix products. Uh, and again, defining gamma ij to be those conditional probabilities. 
uh, that I introduced earlier, this matrix equation be written very neatly as a column vector P of T equals this N by N matrix gamma of T times P of zero, the column vector of initial probabilities. Right, so gamma of T consists of conditional probabilities. That means it satisfies the two basic properties that define a left stochastic matrix. Its entries are non-negative. And if you sum on I fixing J, fixing J, fixing what you're conditioning on, I gives a probability distribution. And if you sum on I, which corresponds to summing down the columns, you get one. So far, this is all textbook stochastic process theory. You'd find this in a textbook like Ross's textbook. OK, but now we're going to say as general as possible. I'm not going to assume that gamma of T describes a Markov process. This is in contrast to the assumption made almost immediately in textbooks and most phenomenal logical applications of stochastic process theory, to the extent that when people say stochastic, they often mean Markovian. In particular, I'm not going to assume things like a discrete time Markov process, a discrete time Markov chain, which is a special kind of Markov process. In a discrete time Markov chain, which is frequently used in phenomenological applications, you assume you can discretize time into integer steps of some basic time scale delta t, and then write the stochastic matrix for uh, n steps of time as the product of some fixed constant stochastic matrix multiplied by itself n times. That simplifies things a lot, but we will not be making that assumption. A less well-known approximation is called divisibility. This is more recent. It's been introduced in the research literature a little more recently. Um, but this is the statement that for all times t bigger than t prime bigger than zero, one has the following semi-group property or composition law satisfied by the stochastic matrices. So gamma of t here is our original stochastic matrix. Gamma of t prime is the same time-dependent stochastic matrix, but evaluated it at the other time t prime. Um, and the question is, does there exist another matrix, gamma of t from t prime, that's that t arrow t prime, um, does a genuine stochastic matrix exist that satisfies this identity? That means it's got to be non-negative entries and um, its columns have to sum to one. In general, um, such a, a matrix won't exist that connects uh, the stochastic process um, across those two times. Uh, that means in, in general, systems will have indivisible stochastic dynamics. And just to make clear that this isn't some strange or unusual assumption, here's a very simple two by two smoothly time dependent stochastic matrix. It is non Markovian and it is indivisible. In fact, it's just a Gaussian in time. Uh, it's not periodic. Uh, everything is perfectly smooth and differentiable. Here, tau is some fixed time scale, a constant, and t is the variable. Here's another example. This one's periodic, so it exhibits recurrences. Um, and these are the generic case. You can just provably show that if you try to write down a composition law, it will fail. If you try to write down that intermediate gamma matrix, that intermediate stochastic matrix, it will have non it will have negative entries. It will not be a valid stochastic matrix. And this is the generic case. OK, so I promised I would show that there's a connection here to the Hilbert space formulation. Let's construct it. So the first step is to take that annoying inequality and solve it by expressing gamma um, ij of t, the ij entry of the stochastic matrix, as the absolute value squared of the entries of some new matrix. This is not a, an axiom or positive. It's a mathematical identity. I can just take the square root of the entries if I want. That certainly exists. But I can be more general uh, and, and, and regard them as the absolute value squares of something else. Now, you don't have to use squares. You could use fourth power, fifth power. You just won't get Hilbert space picture. But I encourage you to consider other reformulations. I mean, we're starting from a new set of axioms. So if you want to study other possible mathematical representations, I encourage you to try that. But our goal here is to start with our physical axioms and reconstruct the Hilbert space picture in particular. And for that, I want to, I want to write down this identity. All right, this matrix theta of t is guaranteed to exist. It is not unique. The other property, this property that the columns of the stochastic matrix sum to one becomes the following summation condition. This will be important. Okay, so this is this summation condition. You square the entries and sum uh, down the columns and you get one. So the mathematical identity that we just wrote down can be expressed rather succinctly in terms of what's called the sure hadamard product. This is defined by naive matrix multiplication, entry-wise matrix multiplication. The sure hadamard product of two n by n matrices has ijth entry that's just the product of the ijth entries, no sum. This is you know, kind of a strange product. We don't usually introduce it in textbooks, not widely known, probably because it's basis dependent. Um, but in, in our case, we have a configuration space that picks out a preferred basis anyway, so we don't care. Um, anyway, you can write this basic identity then as the statement that gamma uh, factorizes uh, as a, 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 a sure Hadamard product of its complex conjugate with itself. Uh, this is the same statement. And this is useful. Uh, you know, conceptually and, and notationally in some circumstances. In particular, so remember, I noted that uh, the uh, theta ij of t, this weird new matrix I introduced, underlies gamma, does not uniquely, um, so this identity does not, it does not uniquely define what, uh, what the n by n matrix theta is. Uh, theta is like a gauge potential. 
Uh, and in fact, there's a corresponding notion of gauge invariance. You can take theta and you can sure had a Mark product with an arbitrary n by n matrix of time dependent phase factors. Uh, at the level of entries, that means I'm rephasing each entry individually um, by uh, an arbitrary time dependent phase factor. So these are like local in time uh, on that fiber bundle that I talked about before. This novel form of gauge invariance, which as far as I can tell, hasn't ever been yet carefully identified in the literature, turns out to be really important for understanding dynamical symmetries. Although I will not have time to talk about that in this talk, but I, I could talk about it in the q and if people have questions. So it turns out to be useful. Uh, all right, so again, we're constructing the Hilbert space picture. I'm gonna introduce an orthonormal basis. This is just a standard basis, the sort of Cartesian looking basis with uh, basis vectors that are labeled by the configurations one through end of the system. Uh, they're orthonormal, uh, they're complete. Uh, that's the one by one identity matrix. If you want to work, think in terms of bras and kets, uh, you know, this is the, the same statement in terms of bras and kets. And so this is more familiar to you. I'm nervous about using bras and kets because I don't want to hide my cards. I want to be upfront with everything that I'm doing. And bras and kets, while useful, can sometimes hide what you're doing. All right. So uh, then I'm going to define a projection value measure. This is a set of diagonal projection matrices that each have a single one in the ith entry along their diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Each of them is given by an outer product of one of these configuration basis vectors with itself. They're mutually exclusive. They square to themselves, they're projectors, they're idempotent. And if you multiply different ones together, you get zero. They're also complete. They satisfy that completeness relation. They have trace one as well. And this is them expressed in broadcast notation, if that's more, more familiar to people. Okay, we're now gonna do a very important set of manipulations. So notice, if I take my theta matrix, which remember was this matrix of entries that underlie this stochastic matrix, and if I sandwich it between projection matrices in this way, there's PJ, theta dagger, PI, theta, and then P, and I'm going to work in terms of bras and kets here just to make the mathematical manipulations a little more familiar to people. Well, I get this construction. I see the appearance of the IJ uh, matrix element of theta itself. I see the appearance of the complex conjugate of the IJ entry of theta. You get the ijth entry because of the adjoint, it transposes and complex conjugates. Uh, and then, of course, this becomes absolute value squared of ij uh, times the jth projection matrix. If we take trace of both sides using the fact that the projection matrices have trace one, uh, then we get this identity here. Uh, if I use the cyclic property of the trace, I can move the pj to the other side where it meets its counterpart. And because of idempotence, it squares to itself. And we end up with this simpler relation here. I'm going to write this again on the next slide. Right. So this is that relation using the basic identity that relates theta and gamma. This says that I can express my stochastic matrix, its entries, in terms of this interesting looking trace. This is a new result. Um, I've scoured the literature. It has never been written down before, at least not for this purpose. Um, I can talk about it. It showed up once in a paper as an intermediate step for a completely different set of arguments. Um, uh, and this, this new result is, is uh, a dictionary. It translates between stochastic process theory, that's the left-hand side, and a Hilbert space formulation, that's the right-hand side. And at, it, what, what I'm going to do is, is, is show how this unspools the Hilbert space picture of quantum theory. I'm going to call it the dictionary or the stochastic quantum dictionary and all that follows. This is important equations, so it's boxed and, and large. All right, let's go back to our standalone probabilities again. Remember this marginalization relationship we had? Well, now I'm going to insert the dictionary in for that stochastic matrix in that marginalization formula. All right, so I insert it, I get this expression here, and now I'm just going to manipulate it. I'm going to move, uh, use the linearity of the trace to move the initial standalone probabilities in the summation inside. I get this formula here. Now I'm going to use the stochastic, uh, cyclic property of the trace to move theta dagger to the other side. And then I get this. All right, well, this may not look like much, but let's uh, introduce some uh, notation. We can write this as uh, the standalone probability at the later time t, the ith standalone probability, is given by the trace of the ith projector times rho of t, where rho of t is state of t, rho of zero, theta dagger of t. It's a similarity or conjugation transformation of some other matrix, rho of zero. And rho of zero is given by the following spectral decomposition. It's a sum on the initial probabilities multiplied by the corresponding projectors. It's a diagonal matrix. It's basically the diagonal matrix with the initial probabilities along the diagonal. Um, the summation condition on theta guarantees that at all times the trace of this new matrix is one. Now, you, you may be tempted to call this a density matrix, and we will, and, and we'll, we'll argue in a moment that it is, but these are certainly properties we're familiar with about density matrices. All right, now let's let A be a random variable on the configuration space of our system. That means it it's some, has some spectrum of magnitudes or, or values. Um, and basically what this means is that if the system is in its ith configuration, then this random variable has 
AI as its value, but we're going to be general and allow these values potentially to depend explicitly on time as well. Well, this is the standard formula for how you compute a mean or, or expectation value or statistical average of one of these things. It's the weighted average um, uh, over, its, over its magnitudes over the standalone probability distribution at the given time. So this is the basic formula. And now what I'm going to do is insert the formula we already obtained for the i standalone probability at t uh, into that formula. I'm just going to insert that there. Uh, and then after some simple you know, some manipulations, you get this very familiar looking formula, which says the expectation value is given by trace of a of t rho of t. So here, a of t is given by the following specialty composition. It's again a sum over the projection matrices. It's the ith projection matrix multiplied by the ith magnitude of, of, uh, of this random variable summed over i. It's a diagonal matrix here with the uh, magnitudes along the diagonal. Let's suppose, as a simplifying case, that the standalone probability distribution at the initial time is pure. Okay. So, and this is pure, classically pure. I mean, we know with certainty that the system is in its jth configuration at the initial time. That means that P of zero, the probability vector of the initial time, is just the jth uh, configuration basis vector for some j. Well, we know that the initial density matrix is a diagonal matrix with the probabilities on the diagonal. In this case, there's just a one in the jth entry. Uh, and that means that the initial density matrix is the jth projector, which is this outer product of the jth configuration basis vector with its adjoint. Well, if I plug that into the definition of rho at other times t, then I see I get this very neat factorization over on the right-hand side. That is, if I introduce a new, new column vector psi, psi here is defined as state of t multiplying that initial probability vector, um, then rho of t factorizes at all times. It's rank one, and it factorizes as this new n by one complex valued uh, um, column vector with its adjoint. If you compare this with our marginalization formula, which gave us the final probability vector, the real final probability vector, you can see that effectively what we've done here is kind of taken the square root of our stochastic conditional probabilities and evolving with kind of their square roots gives us this n by one column vector psi instead of our probability vector. Okay. So it's again, it's like we're evolving by the square root of gamma. Now, if I take uh, that special form of the density matrix and plug it into the formulas for the uh, formula for the uh, standalone probability psi, I get this very familiar looking formula, right? This is the Born rule. Um, if I plug it into my formula for expectation values of random variables, I get our familiar formula that you sandwich the matrix representing your random variable between uh, the state vector and its adjoint. Notice, by the way, here that by construction, the ith entry of this n by one complex vector we've introduced psi is really just the name for a particular entry of the theta matrix, which underlies our stochastic uh, uh, our stochastic matrix. Psi as a whole, the whole column vector, is just the jth column of theta of this uh, of this uh, matrix theta. Um, so whatever psi is, at least in this approach, it's it's not like a physical object. Um, it's a piece of a law like or nomological thing theta, which again is a non unique way to represent the system's dynamics. Well, these ingredients look familiar. We see theta here is playing the role of a time evolution operator. Rho is playing the role of a density matrix. Notice at generic times, not diagonal. Psi of t plays the role of a state vector or wave function. And A of t plays the role of a self-adjoint linear operator representing, say, an observable. Although at this point, we we're only talking about diagonal observables. But we'll, we'll come back to that question in, in a little bit. One can even at this point go ahead and define a Heisenberg picture where you fix state vectors and density matrices at the initial time and move the the time evolution operator over to your uh, your random variables, they will no longer be diagonal now. Um, and we'll come back in a little bit and talk about uh, why this is why this is useful for our, our purpose. Um, so again, the uh, random variables may depend explicitly on time, given that their magnitudes may depend on time. But now in the Heisenberg picture, they, they also um, inherit a time dependence, an implicit time dependence from the time evolution operator. And you can check that this, this change leaves all of our probability and expectation value formulas invariant. OK, let me talk a little more in detail about dynamics now. In particular, given a time evolution upper theta, and, and remember, I haven't made any special assumptions, assumptions yet on theta. Theta is generic. It's just you know square roots, essentially, of the entries of our stochastic matrix. And I wasn't making any simplifying approximations for that stochastic matrix. But given any such theta, one can always define a set of new operators, k1 through kn. Each of them is defined by taking one column of theta and setting all the other columns to 0. There are n ways to do this. And I'm labeling them by a subscript beta that runs from one through n. Okay. And below the, this matrix representation, I have the definition directly in terms of entries. This is something you can always do. It's important to note, I haven't made any special assumptions here. You can always define k matrices this way. Well, you can check that the summation condition on theta 
which is a little bit awkward to write down in terms of these new matrices becomes a very nice matrix looking, uh, um, has a very nice matrix looking representation, it becomes the so-called Krauss identity. If you take the adjoint of the beta if Krauss matrix, multiply it by itself, and then sum on beta, you get the identity matrix, which you can think of as a generalization of unitarity, and we'll be coming back to unitarity in a moment. But you can also show that these, these, uh, uh, these new uh, matrices, which are called Krauss operators, like I said, um, they give another way to write down the time evolution of the system. So instead of rho of t being theta of t rho of zero theta dagger, you can write that same time evolution this way as well. This sort of time evolution is well known in quantum information theory. It's called a quantum channel, also known as a completely positive trace preserving map. Now, what's special about uh, quantum channels um, is something called the Steinspring dilation theorem. So just to remind you, like the Hilbert space formulation we've introduced here is just useful mathematical representation. We're not uh, uh, giving it any deep metaphysical significance. So we can, we can modify this as much as we want. It's a highly malleable tool. Uh, in particular, the specific Krauss operators that, that we defined here, they're not unique. Um, although you can always write down the ones I happen to write down, you can write down others. A given uh, you know, uh, uh, quantum channel may not necessarily have a totally unique set of Krauss operators. Um, but uh, moreover, what you can do is you can, you can dilate the Hilbert space. You can actually increase the dimension of the Hilbert space if you want, as long as you hang on to your uh, projection valued measure and they continue to satisfy the standard properties. As long as you hand P1 through Pn, you're actually free to enlarge the Hilbert space representation if you wish. And then the Steinspring dilation theorem, which goes back to 1955, uh, proves that by dilating the Hilbert space formulation appropriately, and you can accomplish this formally by, say, adding an extra degree of freedom, you can turn a Krauss decomposition into unitary time evolution. On that larger Hilbert space. And in fact, you can show that the maximum size of the new Hilbert space you need if you started with an n-dimensional Hilbert space is n cubed, which can be implemented by adding a single degree of freedom with n squared values or two degrees of freedom with each with n values. Um, you know, there are many ways to do this. All right. That means that merely by dilating the Hilbert space formulation if needed, one can always assume that your stochastic matrix is unistochastic. This was a term introduced by Robert Thompson in 1989. Um, that just means that the entries of your stochastic matrix are the squares of the entries of a unitary matrix U. And this is the same thing expressed in all of our various mathematical forms. That last one is our dictionary. Okay. Here U is a unitary matrix, okay? And that means that state vectors, if, if you have one, uh, and density matrix more generally evolve according to this unitary time evolution operator. Okay, so let's just stop for a second. It's important at this point to take a moment and just, and just talk about what, what's going on here a little more depth. Let's talk uh, about composite systems for a moment. And I want to talk a little bit about interactions, which will play a very important role in what, what, what lies ahead. So recall that a composite system AB consisting of two subsystems has a Cartesian product configuration space, right? That's the configuration space. However, the dynamics of a composite system is more complicated. Uh, if the two systems A and B are fully independent, totally independent systems with their own stochastic dynamics, then the composite system stochastic matrix will naturally factorize as a tensor product. And this is where tensor products make their appearance. Um, and what this allows us to do is neatly identify when an interaction has occurred. If this factorization breaks down, we can say, ah, oh, that must mean there was some sort of interaction, direct or indirect between the systems. We can phrase this breakdown and factorization also at the level of the composite system's time evolution operator, theta AB, right? The, the breakdown of this, at least if this breaks down among all choices of theta AB, is, is going to correspond to the breakdown of, of the factorization for the stochastic matrix. Uh, however, even if the time evolution operator theta B for the composite system, the composites that we've, you know, imagine we have this larger system, even if that uh, time evolution operator refactorizes at some later time, the stochastic matrix for the composite system may be at once factorized. Then the interaction happened, it stopped factorizing. It will not gener generically return to factorizing at later times. Even if, you know, I don't know, the systems are separated or something like that. If there's a notion of physical location in space, that sounds a lot like entanglement, and we'll have more on that later. Anyway, so a time evolution operator is, uh, give a, a beautiful, general, and precise way to define what it means for interaction to occur. We can, we can talk about interaction occurring as the breakdown of this uh, factorization at the level of the time evolution operator's theta, whereas with stochastic matrices, it's a little hard because if the system's ever interacted, then you won't return to factorization. Generically, if we dilate a given system to get you know, this larger Hilbert space where we have unistochastic dynamics, the resulting time evolution operator, the unitary time evolution operator on that bigger uh, dilated Hilbert space will not generically tensor factorize. Physically, what this is saying is that if we take a system with some stochastic dynamics and we regard it as belonging to a composite system, 
maybe a composite system evolving unistochastically with some unitary time evolution operator. Well, then generally what we're going to find is that our subsystem is interacting with the other systems in that sense, that you don't get factorization of the original systems uh, time evolution operator with the rest of the system. So naturally, we'll call the system open in that case. By contrast, if the system you started with, if you are given some system that is already evolving unistochastically, its stochastic matrix is already determined by some underlying unitary operator, and you attempt to regard it as part of some bigger system, what you'll find provably is that the time evolution operator of that bigger system will tensor factorize. That is, a system already evolving unistochastically cannot be interacting with other systems, and this gives a nice way to define what we mean by a closed system. It's a system evolving unistochastically for some choice of underlying time evolution operator u. Well, now all this stuff is going to just spill out. Assuming u is a smooth function of t, as physicists will assume that, the rest is now inevitable. You can define a generator, a self-adjoint Hamiltonian in this way. Here, h-bar is being introduced just if you care about units. If, for whatever reason, we had always been measuring uh, units of energy in the right way, we never would have needed h-bar. Uh, if I go back to the, def the, the definition of psi of t at times t, uh, then the uh, and I take this definition of the self-adjoint Hamiltonian, then what unrolls is the Schrodinger equation. Uh, if I take the time derivative of the time evolving density matrix of the system, I get the von Neumann equation. Uh, if I take time derivatives of uh, Heisenberg picture random variables, I get the Heisenberg equation. Uh, you can compute expectation values. You get the Ehrenfest equation. And I want to just point out, H of t, this generator of the time evolution, is not generically diagonal. diagonal. Rho of t, uh, the density matrix at generic times, not generically diagonal. Heisenberg picture random variables, not generically diagonal. And these brackets here are genuine commutators. They're not Poisson brackets. I'm not making some tortured correspondence to classical Louisville theory. These are actual commutators showing up, even though our system is some configuration and some configuration space. That's surprising. Now, at this point, you might be skeptical that we can empirically access more than just diagonal observables A of T. Now, if your goal is just to use a Hilbert space representation to study uh, phenomenological examples, maybe this is enough. You're only interested in in random variables which have diagonal representations. But if our goal is ultimately to try to get all of quantum theory out, we're going to have to deal with non-diagonal um, observables too, which we'll come to that. But let's, for now, just think about, let's let's talk about another signature or hallmark empirical feature of quantum theory, interference. Let's come back to that question of interference I talked about earlier. So to start, uh, we can use unitarity. We have a closed system. We have you know unitary evolution to define a relative time evolution operator. Unitary time evolution operators, right? They're invertible. They're adjoint or they're inverses. And so we can combine u of t and u dagger at some other time t prime to define this new unitary operator, u of t from t prime over on the left. If I rearrange this definition, I get the following composition law. Okay. So we see that time evolution operators do compose. Right? U, so the first, um, over on the right, u of t prime here, uh, this is the time evolution operator that takes you from 0 to t prime. Uh, over on the left, u of t takes you from 0 to t. And then we have this unitary operator that takes us from t prime to t. We can describe the evolution either using the single operator on the left or the composite product of operators on the right. Well, if you take that new unitary uh, matrix we just defined and, and square its entries, uh, you get a matrix that is genuinely stochastic. In fact, it's unistochastic. So you might go, wait a second, doesn't this mean that the stochastic dynamics does compose? Well, you can define this matrix, but what you'll find is that it does not correctly give you the composition behavior. You'll find the overall stochastic matrix that evolves from zero to T is not expressible in terms of that matrix we just defined and the stochastic matrix that takes you from zero to T prime. In particular, if we compute the discrepancy, the difference between them, you get this expression right here in terms of the Hilbert space ingredients that we just we introduced earlier. This is exactly the set of cross terms that describes interference. It's the exact same formula we use for interference, but we see it's emerging here just from a discrepancy between the system's true indivisible stochastic dynamics and uh, this sort of nearest approximate uh, divisible or Markovian counterpart. So interference is just showing up as this discrepancy between indivisible, roughly speaking, non-Markovian dynamics, they're not quite the same concept, and divisible or the Markovian approximation. So notice we didn't need to invoke waves here. Uh, I wasn't even talking about single particle systems. This just holds in general, whether you're talking about qubits that have a discrete configuration space or whatever. And from this perspective, it was actually an unfortunate accident of history that so many early examples of interference resembled wave interference in 3D. 
Wave functions, after all, don't usually even live in 3D space. Schrodinger knew this in his 1926 paper introducing undulatory mechanics, in his undulatory theory of wave mechanics. Uh, he noted that wave functions live in configuration space. He was willing to, he was committed, he was willing to take that seriously, but it's worth noting that we've always known they don't really live in physical space anyway. The N particles in 3D have a configuration space of dimension 3N. And of course, you know, there is an approach to quantum theory that, that uh, uh, wave function realism that, that you know, follows in, in Schrodinger's interpretive footsteps and tries to regard configuration space as the seat of reality, uh, but we're not obligated to do that. Um, and in fact, there are more abstract systems that don't even have config, uh, continuous configuration spaces. You know, there's, we don't know that, that particles are the fundamental ingredients of reality. It could be fields, it could be discrete things, qubits, who knows? Um, and, and these systems, you know, qubits in particular, don't have continuous configuration spaces at all, but they certainly do have interference. Okay. But um, from a practical standpoint, we now have a framework because the framework can accommodate non-Markovian indivisible dynamics. We now have a way to provide a theoretical justification, theoretical grounds for why the Markov approximation turns out to work so well in phenomenological applications. Rather than what most textbooks do is just assume a Markov approximation and just guess and check. We can provide like a, 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 maybe a better explanation for why that guess and checking has been working all this time. So now we're gonna take our system to be a composite system. There's a subject system and an environment. This is our A and our B now. And let's suppose for simplicity that for each configuration I have the subject system, the environment has a corresponding configuration that I'm going to label by the configuration I of the subject system. So the way you should read this is the environment has witnessed that the subject system is in its I of configuration. Now you can generalize this. You can allow for degeneracy. It just makes the math messier, but there's nothing that, that fundamentally changes. For simplicity, I'm going to assume there's just one environment configuration for each of the configurations I of the subject system, although the environment could have many more configurations beyond that. And I'm going to assume that whatever the stochastic matrix for the overall system is, it has somehow yielded a classical correlation. So the joint probability at time t prime for the subject system to be in its I prime of configuration and the environment to be in its E prime of configuration is given by this simple formula here. This says that there's some probability distribution over the subject system to be in its configurations and, and whichever it's in, uh, the environment with probability one has, uh, is gonna be in the configuration corresponding to it and probability zero otherwise. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume at least for a brief moment of time, there's no interactions between the subject system and environment because if there are, then I won't be able to factorize their evolution uh, and that's even true classically, right? If you have a system that is in the midst of interactions with something else, you, you can't talk about the dynamics of just the system by itself. So at least for a brief in, in moment in time, I'm gonna assume that the interactions are weak enough that we can ignore them. Well, then if you just marginalize over the environment at later times t bigger than t prime, notice I'm not invoking partial traces or anything like that. This is, this is a classical joint probability, so I'm just marginalizing. If I marginalize over the joint probabilities uh, at the later time t, at later, yeah, later time t, um, then from a simple calculation, what you find is you get the following expression over here on the right-hand side, a linear relationship, right? This gives a linear relationship between the final standalone probabilities of our subject system and the standalone probabilities at that intermediate correl correlating time T prime. That means that our stochastic dynamics does in fact divide at T prime. Due to the correlating interaction with the environment, there's a new division event at T prime playing the role of T equals zero. It's the new T equals zero, T prime. Uh, and this is what a division event is. It's, it's a, a break in the stochastic dynamics. It's the appearance, the sudden appearance of divisibility at some time due to correlating in interactions with uh, an external system like the environment. And these are going to be ubiquitous. If you've got a big open system in contact with a strong contact with an environment and, and, you know, basic idea is if the environment is checking in on the system over some uh, time scale, some characteristic time scale, you're going to get these division events repeatedly. And this is going to produce the Markov approximation. It's easy to show that time t prime, if you do compute the reduced density matrix of the subject system, you'll find it's momentarily diagonal just at t prime. And this, of course, is decoherence. So what we learn, number one, is that the off-diagonal entries in a generic density matrix, you know, forgetting about decoherence or whatever, the off-diagonal entries more generally, um, they're called coherences. For state vectors, they correspond to superpositions of state vectors. Um, they're merely a mathematical artifact of having non-Markovian indivisible dynamics. And decoherence itself is just what the routine leakage of correlations out of the environment looks like when you see it through the lens of the Hilbert space formulation. And this explains why missing non-Markovianity and indivisibility was such a hindrance. It really is the secret sauce. It is, it is what those off-diagonal entries of your density matrices are. And if you pretend that all the stochastic dynamics is Markovian, you're going to miss that, and you're not going to be able to construct all of quantum theory. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this case of two systems interacting. 
And again, just as a reminder, even classically during an interaction, systems have non-factorizing dynamics. You know, maybe there's a potential energy that doesn't cleanly factorize for the two systems. So in our case, we can consider two subsystems again, A and B. Uh, if they're not interacting with each other from the initial time t equals zero up to just before some time t prime, then again, the composite system stochastic matrix will factorize, it'll tensor factorize between the two systems. Uh, however, again, if an interaction takes place uh, against uh, gamma, the stochastic matrix of the composite system encodes cumulative statistical information, and that means that after time t prime, at least until another division event, the composite stochastic matrix will fail to factorize. Okay, this already looks like entanglement, as I mentioned before. But notice if there's a division event, suppose at some later, later time t double prime, bigger than t prime, maybe the environment or some other big external system comes in and, and classically correlates with at least one of the two systems, then you're going to get a division event at that t double prime. That means the overall stochastic matrix of the composite system is going to have a division event. It is going to divide at the time t double prime happening after the interaction at t prime. Well, if there are no further interactions after t prime, then that new genuinely stochastic matrix gamma a b t from t double prime will tensor factorize between the two systems and we'll get a restoration of uh, factorization between the two systems that is the division event decoherence causes a breakdown entanglement just as expected okay now we're going to talk about the measurement process we're almost at the end um and uh, as a, a motivation for why why we're going to be able to act why we should be interested in non-diagonal uh, observables and how to access them uh, I'm going to start with introducing the notion of an emergible. Um, and again, in a moment, I'm going to explain the terminology. It, it's uh, it's to be distinguished from beables, and I'll say in a moment what I mean by that. All right, so notice if we're given a random variable A for our system, and if you want to think of the system as like a particle, A could be the position of the particle. Well, if you think about a particle for a moment, right, if you know exactly where a particle is, but the dynamics is stochastic, you don't know where it's going to be even an instant later. And that means like velocity and momentum, are not going to be sharply defined. If you want to look for the nearest thing to something like a velocity or momentum in a picture like that, here's what you do. You take your random variable, you'd go to the Heisenberg picture, and you take its time derivative. And you do that, use the product rule, you get this formula here. For simplicity, I'm assuming A has no explicit time dependence, like a position would have no explicit time dependence. But you can put that in if you want, it just makes things messier. And then you can take a limit, T goes to zero. And what you get at the end of this limit is a new operator, a dot, that is not generically diagonal. It is self-adjoint, and it does not commute in general with the original random variable a. So we already get a non-commutative algebra, and we get non-diagonal matrices showing up. This new operator, a dot, mixes configurational information from a. It mixes it up with law-like information from theta, the time evolution operator, into this emergent amalgam, and that's why I call it an emergible. This is to be contrasted with my random variables, which I guess Bell might have called beables, Beable from like ontologically to be, they are the way the system really is. They reflect what's actually happening with the system's uh, ontological configuration. Emergibles are this sort of soup of mixture of uh, of configurational and 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 um, and law like information to this emergible combination, which is why emergent combination is called I call them emergibles. And again, an example of a is the particle's position, and a dot is its velocity. Then m a dot would be its momentum. And these are actually useful. Yeah, for example, if I take uh, if I um, want to compute the rate at which not A itself is changing with time, which I can't because it's evolving stochastically, but if I compute its expectation value and then compute the rate at which that changes with time, you can see that, that this DAH DT gives a very clean way to write down those, uh, those, those formulas. Okay, so this motivates talking about non-diagonal uh, objects so that we don't yet know what their interpretation is, that, but that's going to be next. So let's consider a, a, a general self-adjoint emergible. This could be A dot, it could be something else for a subject system. Uh, this is its spectrally composition, which we have because it's self-adjoint. Um, this is a new set of project projectors. They form their own projection value measure, but they will generically not be diagonal in the configuration basis. And at this point, I don't have an interpretation for them, at least this point in the talk, but we will in a moment. It also has eigenvalues, but I'm not going to be presuming any meaning for these eigenvalues at this point. At this point, they're just mathematical uh, notions. But if you want to set up a measuring process, now we're going to need three systems, our subject system, and then if you want, you could take the environment and break it up into a measuring device in the environment. And I'm going to define explicitly what I mean by these systems. I'm not going to take measuring devices to be axiomatic primitives. I'm going to tell you what a measuring device is. In particular, I'm going to start by saying that a measuring device has to have at least enough configurations. It's got to have these result configurations, D of alpha, a configuration corresponding to each possible value of alpha. Um, and then what you have to do if you want to make a measurement is you have to set up a measurement process. Can we do this? It depends on whether we have the lab equipment, the technology, right? That's a question for an experimentalist. Can they set up 
a, a stochastic dynamics for the overall system of the right kind. That's the second important ingredient that a measuring uh, device has to have. The third is just that it has to be a robust environment producing division events. Those are the three requirements for a measuring device. But in particular, there has to be some stochastic process that will carry out the measuring process. Um, and you know, this isn't some bespoke, jerry-rigged, gerrymandered stochastic matrix. Um, in fact, you can base it on the kind of unitary operators that you look in, up at textbooks. Uh, we model von Neumann measurements all the time in, you know, in the textbooks. Here's an example of a very simple choice of unitary operator that will do the job. This is something you'd find in a textbook. And, but the interpretation here is different. I'm regarding this matrix, its entries, when you square them, as giving you the entries of the stochastic matrix, so that really there's just the stochastic process for the whole system unfolding. So here, those are the eigen projectors of our original self-adjoint um, emergible. Uh, and these are unitary operators that uh, align the configurations of the measuring device, that's uh, D, and the environment, respectively, uh, to the measurement results. Well, if you just plug this system with its configuration and this stochastic matrix uh, into all of our formulas, our probability formulas, what comes out is exactly what you'd expect. After you marginalize, you find that the probability for the measuring device D to end up in its result configuration, D alpha prime at T prime, is given by the absolute value squared of something. And that something is the subject system's wave function in the emergible's eigenbasis. And this is, of course, the textbook formula. Moreover, if these are probabilities, we can condition on them, and you can condition on them in the usual way. If you condition on the measuring device's results at T prime, and then ask, what is now? the subject system's probability to be in its ith configuration. What you find is it's given by the formula we had before, trace of projector times something like a density matrix, but this is a modified density matrix. The correct density matrix that gives you the answer, this is something you calculate, it's not a postulate. You just do the computation and what spits out is this formula here where this new density matrix is given by the eigenprojector of the thing that was measured, which is the outer product of its state vector with itself, its eigenvector with itself. And of course, this is just textbook wave function collapse. That is, if you want to say what the subject system is going to be doing, the new density matrix for the subject system is going to be this collapsed density matrix. OK, so we're at the end. There are some further points discussed in the paper, and we can also talk about them in the Q&A. This approach attempts to avoid any radically speculative manifestal hypotheses. I'm not proposing that there's some a uh, giant wave function evolving in some huge dimensional configuration space. I'm not proposing there, there are multiple universes. Uh, I'm trying to be as metaphysically humble as possible. We have a system in a configuration space, and the dynamics is a slight generalization of the kinds of stochastic dynamics that we often encounter uh, in studying uh, classical systems. Measuring devices here are not axiomatic primitives. They're ordinary systems. Uh, they have configurations, but all systems have configurations now. What makes a measuring device is what you'd expect if you were an experimentalist. You have to have enough configurations, enough resolution. You have to have the right, be able to set up the right dynamics, and you need a good environment to ensure division events. And this resolves the measurement problem. There's no special status for measuring devices. We get a clearer interpretation of the uncertainty principle from all of this, and I can describe this right now in words. Again, remember, if you have a, like a, a system with a definite value for a beable, let's suppose it's a particle. Particle has a definite position. You know what this is. You know the position of the particle. Well, you don't know what its position is going to be even infinitesimally later because the dynamics is stochastic. And that means we, we don't know what the a measurement of something like a momentum is going to be. But now let's suppose that we measure the emergible corresponding to momentum. The, the analysis we just did in the measuring process shows that after that measurement concludes, the subject system, and this is just the stochastic dynamics, we're just letting it do its business, it, it uh, pushes the uh, system into the midst of a new indivisible process, a new indivisible process represented by the system's density matrix being an eigenprojector of the momentum. Uh, that new indivisible process is non-trivial, has a non-trivial probability distribution now over the configuration space. And now we won't know the particles uh, initial, we don't know the particles uh, position anymore. But that, that new indivisible process that the subject system has now entered is exactly right. So that if you were to try to rerun the measuring process again on the same system a second time for the momentum, you get the same result on your measuring device as you got before. So we can see how you get the measure, the, the asserted principle showing up in this story. You can carefully check all the various no-go theorems. And again, we can talk more in the discussion Q&A about how this navigates the no-go theorems. But for example, Cauchy and Specker is avoided because we're not claiming that all observables are beables. Uh, PBR is avoided in ways similar to how they're avoided in, in uh, Bohmian mechanics. In particular, the measuring process is not a passive 
uh, process of revealing pre-existing facts in general. It does alter the system being measured. And we can talk about Bell and all that other stuff later. In particular, connected to the, to the Bell, to Bell's theorem, um, one can argue, and we can discuss this later, uh, that this approach is no more or less dynamically non-local than textbook quantum theory already is. If you are of the view the textbook quantum theory is already non-local, the cat's out of the bag, and you accept Bell's 1975 generalization of his original 64 theorem, uh, well, then this is just as non-local. If you dispute the premises that lead to Bell's stochastic generalization of his 1964 no-go theorem, uh, and you dispute, therefore, that textbook quantum theory is, is, is not local, you believe it's local, uh, this jumps through exactly the same hoops, and this is therefore local in the same sense. Uh, this framework has a very interesting relationship with special relativity. It's compatible with special relativity, um, where you replace t equals zero, t, you know, t equals t prime with Cauchy hypersurfaces, sheds some interesting new light on the role play by the complex numbers, uh, and has a number of other arguable um, improvements over other interpretations of quantum theory. Future directions. So this approach gives new ways to think about and maybe even generalize what we mean by dynamical symmetry, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, it'd be interesting to explore the ramifications of this approach on algebra-first approaches, including the famous problem of unitary in, unitarily inequivalent representations of Seastor algebras. Um, now, I mentioned this at the very beginning, and this is maybe one of the more exciting practical consequences. It would be interesting to see if one could develop new algorithms for fitting uh, um, uh, Hilbert space representations of stochastic processes, maybe machine learning, maybe some you know cool cool trick for doing that, uh, for simulating um, uh, real world systems beyond the Markov approximation with potential applications throughout the sciences. It would be very interesting to take this highly general framework and actually sit down and construct specific models for different kinds of quantum systems, particles, indistinguishable particle systems, condensed matter, QFTs, and so forth. Um, it's possible that with a, a clear picture now, you could develop new intuition about these systems that we didn't have before. It'd be very interesting to know if you could take this framework, go back to those two axioms that we introduced, and maybe imagine modifying them and seeing if you get a new theory, that generalized quantum theory. And I have a suspicion, which could be unfounded, that this might be a necessary step toward a theory of quantum gravity. In, uh, in a gravitational theory, in general relativity, the metric tensor is not given to you a priori. It is a dynamical thing that you're supposed to find. And if you're not given the metric tensor in advance, you don't know what time-like and space-like even mean. And that puts some pressure on those initial axioms. But if you're already in the Hilbert space picture, which I would argue bakes in those axioms, that may not be the right place to stand if you want to find the way to do quantum gravity. You may have to go back to those earlier physical axioms, revisit them, adjust them to make them more compatible with GR, uh, and then proceed from there. And in particular, uh, I haven't yet, and this just bucked me my ignorance, I'm unaware of any fully general, comprehensive, credible probabilistic, forget quantum mechanics, probabilistic generalization of general relativity. Arguably, that would be an important step toward, uh, toward thinking about this. That's it. All right. Um, and I'm trying to get my chat window also open separately. Pop it out. OK. Great. Okay. So the first hand I have is from Johannes. Hello, Johannes. How are you? Hi, Jacob. Thanks very much for this really fascinating talk. I very much enjoyed it. Covers a lot of ground. Um, so everything made total sense to me up until the point where you claimed that you get the uncertainty relations out of your story. Ah, okay. Let's and talk I would about be that. very, very interested how, how you get that because to sure. me, what you're doing is giving a very general framework of transition probabilities. Correct. And that applies to classical mechanics as well. So I think everything you said is totally um, compatible. You can give classical and quantum transition probabilities. The, you can give a similar account. And I, I felt like you're giving, you are um, doing something like a, a very general stochastic hidden variable theory. Yes. That's that was right. my impression. That that's exactly right. Yes, so, it is so, a stochastic, hidden, a highly general stochastic. So where do you get where do you get the non commutativity of your observables? And then I think there's another problem with defining. So if A is the position observable, let's say, then you, you said that the momentum is just the time derivative of that. 
is I, the time derivative of the Heisenberg picture version of that. Of that. Okay, that's maybe that's right. different because that yeah. usually doesn't work if you have a, in the Bohmian case, right? That's not what no. you get out of your the Bohmian case. Let, let me actually, this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about how this differs from Bohmian mechanics. So this, I'm really glad you brought this up. And let me just also add that, like I said, the secret sauce here is not making the Markovian assumption. All this non-diagonal, you know, if you reimpose the Markov approximation, which you can do in this framework because Markovian evolution is a special case, you can do it by taking your time evolution operator and sticking in lots of projection matrices. Uh, and if you do that, what happens is the coherences disappear, things diagonalize, you don't get non-commutativity. So like, it, it does look almost like what we're doing is classical, um, but I had a really wonderful conversation a while ago with, with Emily, who I think is here, um, who you know pointed out, I think, you know, incredibly astutely, that there is something a little non-classical about fundamentally indivisible or non-Markovian dynamics. And I'm willing to accede to that. Like, sure, it it that that may be a little bit non-classical at the dynamical level. And a lot of really non-intuitive stuff happens then. A lot of our intuition around probabilistic dynamics comes from the Markovian assumption. If you drop it, things get very unintuitive. And so it's not such a surprise that we didn't realize that there was this potential connection to quantum mechanics. Now, let me talk a little bit about the connection to Bohmian mechanics. So uh, Bohmian mechanics is also defined on a system's configuration space. But Bohmian mechanics proposes a deterministic law uh, through the guiding equation. The guiding equation tells you directly what the particle's velocity is. You can think of a, a law that tells you what the velocity is as a law that tells you at each step in time what the particle's position is going to be at the next infinitesimal step. So this is a continuum limit of a deterministic permutation type matrix dynamics. So it's, it's, a spec, it's like a degenerate case of stochastic dynamics where your stochastic matrix trivializes, you just get zeros and ones in it, it's a permutation matrix, and you take an appropriate continuum limit. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's what happens in, in, in Bohmian mechanics. What's a little strange in the Bohmian approach is that that you know, deterministic version of the stochastic matrix, that deterministic permutation matrix, is not what you get your wave function out of the way you do here. You get the wave function out of imposing the Schrodinger equation separately and letting the wave function evolve according to the Schrodinger equation with the standard unitary time evolution operator. And then you take that time evolving wave function and you stick it into the guiding equation and it defines your deterministic dynamics. And then to get probabilities out, you have to make an initial equilibration hypothesis and there's all this other stuff that you have to do. Uh, this approach is just much simpler. It has fewer ingredients. You don't need an initial equilibration hypothesis. The probabilities are just built right into the laws. Um, however, you do give up determinism. On the other hand, it's not entirely clear how to generalize the Bohmian approach beyond certain you know, relatively simple systems uh, and retain that determinism. At least I haven't seen very many highly compelling uh, ways to do that. So you do lose a little, you lose the determinism, but you gain a high degree of generality and it's somewhat axiomatically simpler. Um, and then you're not trying to figure out whether wave functions are ontological or nomological. You know, in this case, that's, that's sort of beside the point. So I don't know if that gives maybe a, a better picture of what's going on here in the connection to Bohmian mechanics. And what about the uncertainty relations? Right, so um, the picture- if you're, if you're claiming that that comes out from the non-Markovianity, then right. what do you get for the, the commutator relation? Do you get a value for that? You, you get the standard commutator relation if the dynamics you're, you know, if you have like a particle system and the unitary uh, operator that you're using is the standard P squared over two M plus V that, that you know, this, this framework is, is mathematically equivalent to the Hilbert space framework. You're going to get the same, you know, uh, commutator. Um, where what's going on here that's different from what you'd usually think of in a classical system is um, uh, number one, the non Markovian Markovianity is important, right? That gives you these non diagonal emergibles. You get a non diagonal momentum operator. But the second thing is, if you go through that measuring process that I went through, at the end of measuring the momentum emergible, uh, you know, when you condition on the measurement result, the correct density matrix now to use for making those conditional probabilistic statements about your, your particle system is, is a density matrix that's now in the midst of this new indivisible process defined by the eigenprojector of, say, the momentum. Uh, that's this weird non-classical thing going on. The measurement was not a passive operation. It took the system from being in a configuration where you knew its position exactly it put it into a new indivisible stochastic process represented by that eigenprojector. 
the density matrix is now this non-diagonal eigenprojector. That indivisible process is exactly right so that if you measure momentum again, you get the same result. But now there's a non-trivial probability distribution over the configuration space of the system. And now you will have uncertainty over where the, the system is. And this generalizes uh, from particles. It even generalizes past one of the observables being a vehicle. You get the same kind of reasoning for two emergibles also. What you can't do is get an uncertain principle between two vehicles because they're diagonal and they commute with each other and you don't get it. So one of them, at least one of them has to be an emergible, but that makes sense because the uncertainty relations do depend on the two observables not commuting. Thank you. I do have more questions, but I guess I'll let other people ask the question and step in again later. Maybe. Thank you. The next hand I have is from Stephen. Stephen, please go ahead. Hi, Jacob. Thank, thanks for the talk. That was uh, very interesting. And I think I need to take a little more time to digest uh, some of it um, to fully understand. Um, I actually was going to ask about the relation of Bohmian mechanics, but since you answered that, I'm going to ask um, the, the question that I that is always on my mind when someone talks about a new approach to quantum mechanics. Um, and I feel justified in asking this specifically because you made the analogy to Copernican versus Ptolemaic uh, celestial mechanics. So it's certainly true that um, for you know Copernicus, the the Keplerian Copernican model um, and the Ptolemaic model were empirically you know indistinguishable from the point of view of astronomical obs observations from Earth. One, however, could could certainly you know was certainly within Kepler's or Copernicus's um, capabilities to perform a thought experiment where there is an observer in space, and clearly you know the two models are empirically very very different uh, to that observer. So my, you know, my question is, um, do you, do you, you know, do you see, is, are you, do you claim that there's, that there's uh, some empirical way of distinguishing this from, from other, you know, uh, formulations of quantum mechanics that don't invoke a, an objective collapse of the wave function? Um, if not, I, I suspect the answer is no. Um, is is the idea that this is um, uh, you know that the the hope is that there's some more fundamental theory. For instance, you you mentioned uh, this leading to uh, you know ideas in, in quantum gravity, where this approach would yield um, would either, either yield a theory where other approaches don't, or would yield an empirically different theory. This is a great question. Let me just say right off the bat, this is a no collapse interpretation meaning that collapse is not imposed uh, as, as, a, you know, as an axiom. Um, that paper I cited before, the Glicodami paper that we, you know, was published in, in 2020, um, I, I didn't just cite it as just a random example uh, of a paper that explores non-Markovianity in, in quantum theory. I, I cited it because the paper shows something that I think we all suspect or would have suspected, or maybe some of us already know, um, that uh, wave function collapse, if you impose it, strict literal textbook wave function collapse has empirical consequences, right? right? It actually produces right. somewhat different empirical results from assuming that we don't have exact collapse. Now, if the systems you're dealing with are very large, macroscopic systems, we would expect those discrepancies to be, you know, extremely small, very, very, very hard to measure. And then you're in the regime of, you know, Kepler imagining that he's floating in outer space, right? right. Thought experiments that are not physically achievable. But maybe one day we can achieve them. I mean, we are, we have much better control over small quantum systems, and maybe we're going to be able to probe regimes in which these distinctions could arise. So this approach is empirically different from textbook quantum theory in being a no collapse interpretation. However, that means that it's going to be probably empirically indistinguishable from other no collapse interpretations, right. like Everettian right. quantum mechanics, Bohmian mechanics. Um, but it would make it empirically different from approaches like GRW that impose something like an explicit collapse postulate. So this question of empirical distinction is, is subtle. I mean, yes, it does differ from textbook quantum theory in that it's a no collapse approach that doesn't treat collapse like a fundamental physical process. Um, but beyond that, I'm not 100% sure, except to your later point, this point you, you, you made referring back to how maybe we need to go back to these lower level axioms and generalize them to get maybe a theory that we need to talk about quantum gravity. I've had some conversations with some of my colleagues in, in you know, work in quantum gravity on this. And actually there's some agreement that, that this might actually be a promising way to think about things. So if ultimately we go back to those axioms and we, we modify them, maybe we have to change 
that's dynamical axiom when we can't talk about stochastic conditional probabilities from one slice of time to another, we have to do something different. We might get a different theory and that could lead to different empirical predictions. Just to, to your, your point that, um, uh, that no claps, you know, theories without claps are empirically distinct from theories with objective claps. That's, this is something that for, you know, I, I am uh, an experimental physicist this is something that for like 15 years I've been trying to correct, you know, my colleagues on where, you know, who, who don't appreciate that point. So, yeah, in the Glicodami paper, what they do is they imagine uh, a sequence of, of measurement like dynamics conducted by mesoscopic devices that are sealed right. up in a box. And these devices, they do like N measurements. And then at the end, a big macroscopic measuring device does a final measurement at the end. And they compare this to what would have happened if each individual n, each of the individual, each of the n individual measuring uh, um, uh, um, interactions had been a collapse. And what you find is you get two distinct empirical answers at the end. Only the distinction becomes extremely small if the mesoscopic devices are big and in strong contact with the environment. So um, yeah, th this would in principle lead to empirical differences. But again, I don't think it would lead to a, a clear empirical difference be between this and other no collapse approaches. Thanks. Thank you very much. Eric, nice to see you. Jacob, hello. So, uh, hello. That, that was a very rich talk and, that, that, and uh, really uh, stimulating and provocative. So I, I have a lot of questions, but I will just um, both technical and conceptual, but I'll maybe I'll, I'll stick to my most, I'll start with my most pressing one and add myself to the end of the queue if there's time. So um, you be, the setup uh, depends on, um, on starting out with what you're calling a configuration space. Yes. And this seems to me, and you, you then develop what seems like a very ingenious, uh, a, you know, uh, attempt to solve the measurement problem if, uh, based on this dictionary you build with the Hilbert space formalism. But I worry that, that you're kind of building in the solution to start because the, um, assume, assuming this classical configuration space seem, uh, seems to be assuming that there's always a, a kind of canonical privileged way to carve the world up into subsystems. And um, I, I, that, that, that to me is something that seems to be exactly up for grabs and say strongly entangled systems and strongly entangled quantum systems. So I, I wonder if you can just say something about that. Um, so that's a great question. Not only I think it's it's a good question, but it's a question I've actually talked about with some of uh, our, uh, my other colleagues before. Uh, again, if I'm, if I'm not uh, incorrect, I think Emily and I talked about something quite similar to this. Um, yeah, it's, it's an excellent, it's an excellent question. Um, and you know, because the conclusion of this uh, approach is a resolution of the of the measurement problem, somewhere in the premises must have been inherent the the thing that yeah. And, and I and I'm not I'm not going to deny that, right? I'm not going to make some argument that you can deductively get a conclusion that's not inherent to the premises. The question is whether the premises are more reasonable or more credible or simpler or in some sense more physically transparent than the premises we've been using before. And I would argue that they are. We were talking before about quantum gravity. If you start with the Hilbert space picture, it's not clear what new mathematical framework you would need. You know, you need maybe something other than the Hilbert space picture, it's not clear. If you have more physical axioms, maybe this gives you different knobs to turn, different things to think about for finding a generalization. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm totally agreeing with you. Inherent in the premises you know, are the things that do lead to the solution to the measurement problem in this approach. The question about how to pick a configuration space is extremely interesting. Um, so uh, one way to think about, or one way that I like to think about the problem of trying to find a, a good satisfactory interpretation of quantum theory, even separate from the, the measurement problem, is that, it, so go, going back to that analogy, the Ptolemaic astronomy problem again, a Ptolemaic astronomer could say, look, in order to get like in, empirical adequacy in a Ptolemaic model, you have to have so many epicycles this is an incredibly ornate, extremely complicated model. And then Copernicus comes along and Copernicus claims that this, that you that he can recreate this whole thing with a really simple picture of orbs moving along very simple curves. And, and I think a, a totally reasonable reaction by a Ptolemaic astronomer would be, this is impossible. The system is so over-constrained and over-determined. You're never going to find a simple solution that jumps through all of the hoops, right? You know, there was a huge over, seemingly over-determination problem. And remarkably, and, and this is where I, I'm not a historian of science, we do have some historians of science here, perhaps someone can fill me in on this, but 
my, my, from what I remember, Kepler tried like 40 different curves, looking at all of the, you know, astronomical figures he got from Tycho Bray, right? And, and, and finally, it was ellipses with the sun at one focus that, that worked. And it's remarkable that he could be that precise because so many planetary orbits are so close to being circular. But, but he managed to do it. He managed to find a solution. And, and now we would argue it's the ideal solution to that, what we thought was an overdetermination problem, and turns out not to have been. Um, so in a sense, the Hilbert space axioms, right? There's so many of them. There's the Hilbert space, you know, you propose the Hilbert space, you've got a system with a density matrix, you, you have to, you know, propose self-adjoint operators and eigenvalues and all this stuff that we do, measurement collapse. And, you know, it's this very ornate, complicated uh, framework. And, and you know, the way I, I have seen the problem of trying to interpret quantum theory is trying to do what, what Kepler did, find a simple picture that somehow finds that it's, it solves what seems like an incredibly difficult overdetermination problem. Um, arguably, this is one such solution, but you know, probably not the unique solution. If you take this approach, however, then your overdetermination problem becomes an underdetermination problem. Because if you're simply handed a quantum system, you do experiments, you collect empirical data, and you work backward and figure out what kind of Hilbert space, what kind of Hamiltonian they're going to do the job. Well, uh, now your question is which basis is, is going to be the basis for the configurations? What's the configuration basis? This is now an underdetermination problem. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, let me just say that historically, we've always had underdetermination problems, right? The, the, the underdetermination of theory by data is an old problem. And if we can go from an overdetermination or, or seemingly overdetermination problem, where we don't know that there's any kind of picture, back to the, the old time of, of underdetermination problems, I regard that as, as incremental progress at least. Mm -hmm. but, but now I wanna make an analogy between this problem and what one finds in classical physics, because I would argue there's actually a very similar underdetermination problem in Hamiltonian mechanics, classical Hamiltonian mechanics. And you and I talked a little bit about this by email. Mm -hmm. um, so this this will hope this will probably be just a reminder for you, but maybe new for everybody else. In classical Hamiltonian mechanics, if someone just says, "I have a, a here's a Hamiltonian H. It's a function of a bunch of Q's and a bunch of P's. Go." You could say, well, all right, I can write down the canonical equations of motion, I can write down Poisson brackets, I can start calculating things. And maybe someone is even nice enough to say certain complicated combinations of these ingredients instrumentally correspond to certain measurement results. They just tell you certain combinations are going to be certain measurement results. You go, okay, that's that's really that's very interesting. And then someone says, okay, so what is this system exactly? What is the configuration space of this system? You don't have a clue. Right. I mean, you could do canonical transformations, very general canonical transformations. Uh, they can mix up the Q's and P's. They can even mix time in. And in yeah. fact, that unitary local and time V of T unitary transformation introduced way at the beginning is not the same thing as canonical transformations, but it does play a metaphorically completely analogous role. Just as you can do these local and time unitaries on all the fibers of your of your, you know, of your fiber, fiber bundle, Hilbert space thing, you can do canonical transformations and different canonical transformations give you different cues. Mm -hmm. And the different cues might seemingly label very different looking configuration spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have, again, a massive underdetermination problem. Um, now, I'm not claiming I have a solution to that problem. I'm only claiming the quantum problem is basically about as bad. Um, if you want to claim that there is a preferred canonical frame in the Hamiltonian framework. If you notice the Hamiltonian becomes much simpler in a certain canonical frame, and it looks like it's got a nice notion of locality and various other nice properties, you might propose, okay, my working hypothesis is going to be that I'm going to pick that canonical frame to define my configuration space. And again, you might have the same situation in quantum theory, but the truth is you could never know for sure. So uh, I guess so I, I just want to add um, that one of the reasons I really, really like this work is because I, I think it's always a great thing when you have a new formulation of, of a physical theory, it gives you new ways to think about old problems. So e even if you aren't able to address what you're calling the undetermination problem, I think what, you, what you've done so far is fantastic. That's incredibly nice of you to say. I think at the very least it provides, you know, in addition to the path integral formulation and the, 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 the you know, Wigner, uh, Moyle products, you know, space, a phase space approach and quasi probability approach. 
you know, it's it's like a distinct new way to represent systems, which, you know, exactly like you said, even if it, all it does is provide new forms of intuition or new ways to calculate things, I think could be good. That's always useful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and I should just say, by the way, that um, those slides and interactions are very much inspired by your your, your work on thinking about interactions in classical in classical theories. I agree with you that thinking serious about interactions is really very important for making progress on this. Thank you. Uh, Lev, you're next. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Um, yeah, you know, I believe in many worlds and I don't like it. I would like a picture with one world. I don't want to be in many places, but I kind of failed to see how I can see a coherent picture uh, with one world. And uh, the main thing, I cannot see a coherent picture with electron being in one place. So you, uh, I want to, uh, and I think you repeated many times that in the end of the day, there is this configuration space and there is, a, you talk about particle and there is a position. So at every, if, I, if I have just one particle, it's always apparently in your picture has a position. So you considered uh, two slip experiments, it's complicated, but similar one, it's Max Zender. Yep. So what, what is the picture? I start with a particle, it enters. Then in the middle, if, if, if I understand you correctly, it's in one of the arms. And if it's a one of the arms, how I can get this interference? I have no idea how, how it knows that the other arm is closed and not closed. Because there is a locality uh, you know, of interaction in 3D. And here we have no one particle, even no entanglement. I don't ask you to do a GHD, which I also don't understand. Just explain. Can you have kind of intuitive picture in your language of Bach Zeta interferometer? Uh, if the particle is only in one arm, and we have, we know the physics, we understand. Now, now it's come to a beam splitter, and somehow how it knows uh, that the other arm is closed or not closed. This is well, well, why it's matter. If it's in one arm, do you have kind of picture without uh, mathematics, without, you know, I, I want to. Feel it with waves. Everything is I understand it. I say everything are waves, and then I see interference, and everything. And there are sometimes entangled waves, and I can understand GHZ. But when you say no, it's not waves; it's particular position or state all the time. I, I have no intuition. Can you help me? Uh, so, Lev, again, it's, it's it's a great question, and really great to see you. Um, and and I I I, am, I assumed when when I saw you visiting here that we we talk about uh, the Mach Zender interferometer. Um, so the answer I'm going to give you is going to be uh, potentially a little disappointing. Um, so uh, you know ultimately the predictions made by this model uh, manifestly agree with the predictions made by by quantum theory. But this 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 approach uh, uses these indivisible non-Markovian maps, which as I showed do produce the same exact uh, you know, predictions as you get from waves and, 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 and uh, in interference. Um, but I also noted that indivisible non-Markovian dynamics is extremely non-intuitive. So you've asked me for like an, an intuitive picture. How is it that this is all happening? Uh, and the answer is it's happening due to this indivisible law and indivisible stochastic laws are really confusing. Uh, they, they produce clearly very confusing results that are not intuitive. I don't have a good intuitive picture for you. Um, what I'll just say, though, is, um, you know, the question of, of what one regards as intuitive or unintuitive is very much a matter of preference. I'm not going to argue that the Everettian picture is incorrect by any stretch. You know, the Everettian picture is another approach to quantum theory. The Everettian picture makes some things more intuitive, and it makes other things, at least for some of us mere mortals, much, much less intuitive. So the question is, where are you going to put the unintuitive stuff, right? On the one hand, here, a lot of the sort of strange, somewhat unintuitive behavior is baked into these strange, indivisible stochastic laws. Or you could take that unintuitive behavior and propose that there are large numbers or infinitely many decoherent universes. And then you have to make sense of what does probability mean in that kind of a universe? And that's a difficult problem. And ultimately, I think it's a matter of preference, which, which one finds preferable. I don't have a knockdown argument. 
But in the end of the previous uh, answer, you mentioned pass integral and other things, which for me are not interpretation in any way. There no. are a few people who believe so, but for me and for a majority of physicists, as far as I know, it's a mathematical trick. So then it looks like what you proposed, it's another mathematical trick, which works, but it doesn't tell what is really there. You could be correct. You know, like I was just, you know, mentioning with, with, with Eric and like Eric pointed out, you know, even if all this ends up being is a new mathematical representation, that's still useful. But where this differs from the pathological representation is it does lend itself to a picture where you have systems on configuration spaces, but the dynamics is really non-intuitive and, and maybe very difficult for us to visualize. Um, you know, and, and I'm, that's okay with me. It might not be okay with everybody. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Barry, hello. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Jacob. Uh, Hi. Unfor unfortunately, there's noise outside my um, apartment. If it's too loud, I'll, I'll bow out. But if it's I'm okay, not detecting any noise at all. It's sort of okay. quiet on our side. If it's okay, here's the um, what, what I had in mind. First of all, Lev. Hi, Lev. It's always hard to follow Lev question. Um, I was wondering about this, but it was connected to Lev's question. How exactly are you thinking about laws and probability in your account? And who is Ptolemy and who is Copernicus comparing your account to, let's say, Bohmian particle mechanics? Uh, Bohmian particle mechanics gives a pretty clear picture if you adopt the, the uh, well, any of one of the formulations. You have a good understanding of what probability means in those those pictures. Are you thinking of the laws as it, uh, additional elements over and above the um, uh, the 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 sequence of configurations, so that they are it's a so what's called a non union account. And how are you thinking about probabilities? They're certainly not frequencies. Or ordinary propensities. Yeah. So let me just say that uh, um, as I was, you know, developing this approach, I was intentionally trying to remain even-handed and agnostic about one's metaphysical orientation toward laws. I believe that there is a principled way to look at this from a Humean attitude toward laws. Uh, there's some, if you want to resurrect the notion of a human mosaic, there's some human mosaic. The universe is some sequence of configurations, a trajectory in some huge configuration space. We don't know what that trajectory is, uh, but what we, you know, physically embodied, epistemically limited human beings have somehow been able to develop is a framework uh, with a set of descriptive summarizing best system summary type laws that let us make uh, probabilistic predictions about what we're going to see. And in some cases, those probabilistic predictions can become highly deterministic in certain limiting you know, classical regime type situations. One could also be a primitivist, a non-human about, about laws. One could say that the laws are fundamental pieces of the architecture of the universe and that they generate in some sense uh, the uh, human mosaic. And one could take, um, you know, I, I, I find it a little bit challenging to be a dynamical productivist about laws in a, in a relativistic universe. Um, but you know, it's perfectly fine. I don't know if Eddie is, is still here, but um, yeah, Eddie's here. Uh, one could take a primitivist view that's like minimal prim primitivism. Or, or, or Emily also has a similar formulation where we think about laws acting all at once on the entire you know, tapestry or human mosaic. And, and cause it to have a particular uh, trajectory there. So um, I think one could take either view. I'm not attached to either of them. I'm also not committing myself to one view on the meaning of probability. I think it's possible to take different views on what the probabilities here are doing, whether they're you know, probabilities in the sense that we have many similar versions of whatever system we're studying and we try to give them some kind of frequentist gloss or whether we regard them as uh, you know, credence type. I, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't, uh, I haven't put in, at least from my point of view, any strict um, condition on what I mean by probabilities or laws here. In fact, I, I view the flexibility here as a virtue, although it might be nice to have a physical theory that finally gives us an answer as to the right way to think about laws and the right way to think about probabilities. 
I hate to disappoint you, but I regard it as a feature, not a bug, that this is pretty flexible and you can yeah, insert I, whichever view you want. I, I completely agree with that. That was what, what was really with my thinking behind my what, my question, despite what you may have thought. Ah, of this okay, question. yeah. But um, I, I do, well, one thing, it does seem to rule out Maudlin's kind of uh, approach because it seems to be essentially uh, not stochastic in your right. sense. Right, right. Okay. But but I wasn't looking at it to settle an issue about the metaphysics of laws, but I was very puzzled about how you wanted to think about probability in your account. And also to make the point uh, back to your analogy between Copernicus and Ptolemy, which was very striking, that uh, one gets used to a Bohmian picture, one sees it, you know, kind of through the eyes of Copernicus. Or new or Kepler or Newton, and this looks like it's a, you know, a, a kind of uh, what you've done is to get rid of a bit of ontology, whatever though the quantum state represents, and replace it by a more complicated kind of a law. Yep, that that's a fair characterization. What I would just say is that. Um, you know, obviously, among the different interpretive approaches to quantum theory, the one that this most is most you know shares the most with is the Bohmian approach, sure. right? Uh, it has a lot in common with that. This is a, a kind of hidden variables approach. Um, and what I'll just say is, you know, when I first encountered Bohmian mechanics, it was just incredibly elegant, incredibly beautiful. You know, I, I you know, was, I was coming out of you know, Hamill and Jacobi theory, and it just seemed like this incredibly beautiful connection. You know, it it wasn't in Bohm's paper, I'm sure. Uh, I, I, right, I mean, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I encountered it originally in Bohm's original papers. Eventually I got to his papers and then to De Broglie's, you know, early, whatever. But, um, so, I mean, it, it, I do think it's a little more axiomatically complicated, although you get some benefit from that. You get determinism back into the story again. Mm -hmm. And you get, as you, you know, correctly argue, you know, a pretty nice way to think about probabilities. Um, if it generalized to other kinds of systems, I would be really excited about that. But I, I've been around a long time, and it does seem that the Bohmian approach is helping itself to certain very special features of systems of finitely many non-relativistic particles that we just don't seem to have for other systems. So what I'll tell you is, I'm not trying to uh, rule out other interpretive approaches. If someone comes along and gives an approach that's just as simple as non-relativistic Bohmian mechanics that applies more generally to systems that may have continuous, may have discrete configuration spaces, a nice general framework that's roughly as simple and as elegant, I will be very impressed by that. Uh, but I've never seen it. And in the meantime, if I'm not going to sit around waiting, we'll try to proceed in another way. Um, I would argue that this has is somewhat more axiomatically simple. As you pointed out, it has less ontology. The state vector is not proposed as a form of the ontology. Although I will note that in some Bohmian approaches, the state vector is not regarded as ontological either. Um, but the axioms are simpler. And the downside is that you don't have determinism anymore. At least you don't have uh, you know, predictive theoretical determinism. We don't have a model that, can, that we can use to make deterministic statements about what's going to happen. Yeah, thanks. That's fair, fair enough and clarificatory. Thank you. Thank you. All right, John, you're next. Uh, John, can you hear me? John, we're not getting any audio. Yeah, John, we're still not getting any video. I'm so sorry about this. Um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to put you to the end of the queue. And if you can figure out your, your audio issue, we, we can bring you back. I'm so sorry. And I might suggest <clears throat> if you can't, uh, just post your question in the chat if, if worst comes to worst. Yeah, I see in the chat you mentioned you'll come back. Thanks again. All right, Chip, hello. It's good to see you. Hi, good to see you too. Sorry I've been so busy um, lately, but it, there's been a lot going on. No, no worries at all. I, I have a question along the lines of Lev's. Um, just as he was wondering, you know, how do you, how does in your system how does the particle know that the other wing of the interference, um, the Mach zender interferometer, is open? 
I was thinking about the same thing in the double slit experiment. You started with the double slit experiment and was saying that it was the um, Markovian assumption that leads to problems. So I'm curious in your system, how does the non-Markovianity give you the right result in the double slit experiment? And really I'm trying to track like to what degree is it the non-Markovian nature of the dynamics that allows you to get the right behavior? And to what extent is it just like the complexity of the kind of stochastic dynamics you have that gets you the right behavior after passing through the slits? So I'm thinking like at the moment when the particle is going through the top slit or the bottom slit, how is it that its future dynamics are determined by whether the other slit is open? And it seems to me like maybe what's going on is that the uh, stochastic dynamics are so complicated that a lot of the mess of the wave function has been absorbed into the dynamics. And so it's kind of in the dynamical law there that the other slit is open and that there's like what you would have thought of as some of the wave function passing through that slit. Is that right? Or you know, how should I understand what's going on just after passing through the slits? So um, this is a great question. Uh, as, as you noted, right, when, when you drop the divisibility assumption, you get the interference pattern. And in fact, you can, um, you know, in that discussion of, uh, you know, correlating environments and division events, if you have, uh, you know, a, 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 a bit or, or a particle or a tag or something like that, that is able to, to detect which hole the particle went through, the environment comes in, the, the interference pattern goes away. And you, so all this stuff just comes out from the mathematics. Um, the question about the interpretation of what the laws are actually doing is, and I'm sorry to punt again, but I don't have a good intuition for it. Um, maybe at some point I will, but all of our intuition is really based on on certain very simple pictures of how probabilistic laws work. Here we're considering a, a more general kind of probabilistic law. I don't have a good intuition for how they work. And in fact, you know, if you look at textbooks on stochastic probability, this was the most one of the most surprising things about this. I spent most of the, my time working on this project with my jaw wide open. I couldn't believe that things I thought, I couldn't believe the things I was seeing. The first thing I did when I when I thought, well, it looks like we get distinctly quantum mechanical behavior by dropping the Markovian assumption. Well, let me go back and look at the textbooks and see what they have to say about non-Markovian dynamics. And they basically say nothing. If you, you look at the textbooks, they, they just immediately assume the Markov approximation or they work with Poisson processes or something like that. Um, and, and so I started looking at the research literature. I'm like, surely someone has systematically examined non-Markovian processes and it hadn't been done. As far as I can tell, there has never been a good general framework for stochastic processes outside the Markovian approximation, let alone outside the divisibility approximation, which is similar, but not quite the same thing. So we've been missing out on like a century of building intuition for how indivisible non-Markovian processes work. The first step is to at least write down a general framework for them, right? Think of, think of it this way. Um, we had Newtonian mechanics. We had these laws. Uh, and, and then we reformulated Newtonian mechanics in all these different ways, analytical mechanics, Lagrangians and Hamiltonians and all this stuff. Once you have analytical mechanics, there are certain things that you can now do that would have been very hard to do directly from the Newtonian formulation, right? If you're trying to guess new laws of physics, if you have some new system and you don't already know what its laws of physics are, if you have a Lagrangian, if you have an, an understanding of Lagrangian mechanics or Hamiltonian mechanics, you have all these knobs for constructing in a systematic, careful way, new kinds of dynamics, right? Again, this is a, a history point, but my recollection is that when Hilbert got the Einstein-Hilbert action, before, like a month before Einstein wrote down the field equations, he did it by, by constructing a Lagrangian, right? It, it gave this powerful way to predict new laws of physics that would have been hard to do otherwise. Um, what this framework is essentially doing is providing an analytical mechanics for these highly generic non-Markovian stochastic dynamics. Uh, and it, it, interestingly, we had it all the, the whole time, right? It's like discovering, oh, the, the mystery person the whole time was, you know. Um, but because we haven't thought of it that way, we've missed out on like a whole a century of, of taking advantage of this to develop a kind of intuition for indivisible stochastic, highly generic stochastic mechanics that, that we have developed for classical mechanics, deterministic dynamics. So I guess my, my answer would be, maybe we need to wait 50 years working with these systems, thinking about them in, in, in their, in their you know, stochastic realization, seeing how they work. And eventually people will just find it so intuitive that there'll be explanations that, that I, can't, I can't describe. Let me put it in, in, in a slightly different way. So when I talk to, you know, 
uh, colleagues here in, in, in the physics department here at Harvard about, about quantum mechanics, they talk about state vectors and wave functions with all this intuition. They talk about just feeling how a wave function should behave in different situations. And if you tried to you know, uh, present some of the intuitive explanations that they talk about to someone who, you know, a, a highly capable, very highly trained physicist from before the quantum era, they would go, that's not an explanation that makes no sense, right? And, and when you talk to people who are Everettians, and again, perfectly, you know, alternative approach, but, you know, some of the explanations, they say, oh, it makes sense in the Everettian approach. I look at it and I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense to me. But people do develop intuitions from working in a framework, and then it just feels intuitive to them. I know that's kind of a disappointing answer, but I'm arguing we've just opened the door on a whole new way, a whole new set of kinds of dynamics, and we need time to understand what, how, what, how they work and what they mean intuitively. Does that, it's not very satisfying, but that's the best I can say. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jacob. And I, yeah, I hope it doesn't take 50 years to get it. <laughs> I hope not. A more concrete story for this kind of experiment. But um, but yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, Robert, you're next. Thanks. Can you hear me? I can hear you quite well. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, thanks for a very interesting and stimulating talk. And so more than questions, I, I want to make a few comments. Um, so you, you haven't emphasized this very much in your talk, but I would like to, to emphasize, uh, let's say a different perspective on, on what you're doing as, as far as I can see it, that I hope could enrich maybe the discussion and, and taking this into account. Um, so <clears throat> for, for quite some time, we've uh, understood that we can describe um, classical and quantum systems in any unified way. Um, by uh, talking about uh, completely positive maps and uh, state spaces in in a in a more abstract way, and um, <clears throat> so um, of course, uh, yeah. So that's been known since the nineteen seventies or so, and more uh, since the two thousands. This has been uh, 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 pursued, uh, particularly in, in the foundation of quantum theory, in terms of uh, generalized probabilistic theories and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I would like to to emphasize a bit that perspective on on what you were presenting and seeing what what you and and others think about this kind of point of view. Um, <clears throat> so, basically, from that point of view, as far as I can I can see, what you're doing is uh, you are taking uh, your classical phase space, you're embedding it in a, <clears throat> sorry, uh, your, your classical state space and you're embedding it in, in the uh, quantum phase, uh, quantum state space. And then of course you have uh, and a description of, of evolution and measurements and so on that, that applies in, in that context and that you can now specialize to the to the quantum version, and uh, then you can think of uh, going to the Hilbert space and and um, uh, evolution operators of a quantum theory by as a kind of square root, right? Because the the state space of the quantum theory uh, is uh, you can think of the uh, space of self-adjoint operators and Hilbert space basically as a tensor product of the Hilbert space with its uh, its own dual. So in the, so your, your step of, of going from the gamma to the theta uh, matrices uh, is, is this kind of square root really. And then uh, it's, it's very natural that you can express everything uh, in, in this language of quantum theory on Hilbert space. Um, <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so, so, so I think it, it could be worthwhile to, uh, to, uh, to develop this point of view on what you're doing uh, further and maybe that that can add more uh, more to, to the story here. Um, and um, so let me say, uh, make a, a second remark um, which uh, is uh, about the intriguing part of your talk. So yeah. And in fact, it's a, a bit related to, to previous questions uh, in particular of Charles. Uh, about uh, the divisibility. Uh, so I also found this very remarkable when you were saying, okay, so if we drop this uh, 
Markovian indivisibility uh, conditions, then we can uh, model processes that are proper to quantum theory, say, in this framework. Um, and so this, okay, so it might uh, sound a bit crazy what I'm going to say, but <laughs> so, so the way I, I was immediately thinking about this is um, in terms of uh, temporal non-locality, because um, <clears throat> so what, what means non-divisibility is really that you're dropping the condition in, in that you have in classical physics uh, of uh, uh, well post initial data uh, and uh, an evolution that you can describe in, in time in terms of uh, partial, uh, sorry, of uh, ordinary differential equations of finite order. And so, as far as I understand it, this dropping the divisibility condition really corresponds to dropping that. And one way to think about it is as a locality condition, not in space, but in time. Uh, so now, if you think of um, um, <clears throat> trying to describe a quantum theory in a, in a framework that looks, let's say, as classical as possible. Uh, so for example, if we think of uh, hidden variables, theories and approaches, then uh, while well, we know they, uh, for this to work, they have to be non-local in space. So now the, the, the question I would like to pose and which is suggested what, by a lot of things that you are saying is, can we restore locality in space, um, but drop locality in time? And uh, so some of the things you were saying seem to indicate that that's exactly what's happening. So uh, thinking of uh, dropping the divisibility condition as uh, dropping locality in time and thus being able to use this classical looking framework to describe quantum processes. So I just want to throw this out. <laughs> so Let me quickly to... respond to a couple of these. There, there were a lot of important points there. Let me see if I can respond Thanks. to them quickly. And we are running a little short on time. Um, so let me first, quickly first just, just say that uh, I spent a very long time marinating in the Koopman, von Neumann, Sudershen, you know, uh, um, uh, formulation that lets you, you know, work with classical theories and quantum theories in a somewhat more similar way. I've also spent a lot of time thinking about uh, generalized probability theories. Um, this is distinct from the Koopman, von Neumann, Sudershen approach. It's also distinct from generalized probability theories, which are, um, you know, generally presented as instrumentalist tool sets, where you treat measurements by agents as, as primitives. So it, it does differ from those approaches. And this is not to say that there is not huge value in those approaches, but if you're looking for a non-instrumentalist approach, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, you also have this, this, this question about uh, the question of, of the dynamics and questions about locality in space versus locality in time. Uh, we're running a little short on time. Um, uh, let me just quickly say that, that I have had conversations with, again, some of the folks who are here uh, about the question of, of what's going on in, in time with these maps. If you don't have deterministic uh, you know, initial value type problems, and you don't have Markovianity, uh, then something, something is going on with the dependence on time that's not trivial. Um, I, I'm not going to have time to talk in detail about what that is, uh, but, it, it's, it's, um, uh, but maybe we could talk offline about that. Um, I, I think I got to all of, all of your, your points, and I want to make sure we have time for at least one more question, because we have so now Gabriella already asked a question and so did Eric, but David uh, has not asked a question yet. So if it's all right, can we go to David? Um, this, I, and, and maybe it's not, uh, th th this is a way of, of trying to press a little further, but maybe we've begun to get to an answer to it with this non-locality and time associated with non-Markovian stuff. But, uh, I, what I was going to do was just try to press a little further Lev's question and Chip's question and so on. And maybe this is a way to do it. And maybe the comments of the previous questioner about non-locality and time have something to do with this. Here's a way to press their question a little further. Compare it with Bohm's theory again, okay? In Bohm's theory, I've got a particle you know, on its way into a double slit uh, experiment. And um, 
what's going to happen later on, the probabilities later on of landing at certain points, doesn't just depend on the initial position of the particle and the setup of the slits and the screen. It also depends on the initial wave function of the particle. So another way of pressing Chip's question and Lev's question might be to say, what corresponds in your picture to that sort of additional degree of freedom corresponding to the setting of the, of the wave function? That is a really precise question. And now I understand a little bit more maybe what people are trying to ask about. And I, now, now I have it's a precise enough that I can provide an answer. So you can still do preparations in this framework. But what's going on in a preparation now has a different interpretation. So in the standard sort of textbook quantum, you know, uh, quantum mechanics approach, uh, to prepare a system, uh, you know, in some particular quantum state, you do maybe some initial measurements, and then you identify, you know, on some collection of systems, you identify the ones that come out a certain way, and now you know the initial state vector for the system. And I, I don't know, I mean, uh, depending on whether one wants to take a Copenhagen-ish attitude toward the wave function or treat the wave function like a physical thing, I don't know. But certainly in the way that we talk about it in the textbook approach, the idea is the state vector is something physical in that approach. We've set the system up with some initial state vector, right? Uh, and then we evolve it forward. And in the Bohmian approach, at least if you're going to take a sort of flat-footed Bohmian attitude and regard the wave function as additional furniture in the world, additional right. ontological furniture in the world, when you prepare the system, you have the particle, it's in some initial configuration. You also prepare some initial pilot wave or wave function, and right. then they evolve together. Right. So the question is, what's going on in this picture instead? Right. right. You, of course, can run that entire preparation process in this picture. Yeah. It's just the interpretation the is different. Right. But let me, right. let me get now to the point. Right. So what does it mean to say that the system has some initial wave function? Good. Right. Well, if the system has some wave function at some time, T, whatever your, 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 your time you want to start your experiment, call it T naught. Right. Well, that wave function corresponds to a density matrix. You take the outer product of the wave function you know, with itself, you get some density matrix, and you'll notice that density matrix has off diagonal entries now. It has coherences. Those coherences are telling you that your system is in the midst of a stochastic process. It's in the midst of an indivisible stochastic process. So when you prepare a system in some non-trivial state vector or wave function, what you've done is you've put the system in, into some uh, indivisible stochastic process that's going to have certain consequences. And, and but, those consequences are when you run the experiment, you're going to get certain results that come out. So I, this is, this, um, I'm, I'm asking for more than I can get a quick answer to now, and I, and I apologize. But we can just talk offline about help, this too. Help me, help me just one more step in, sure. in the last minute available to us. The, the, forget about a preparation. Suppose the only thing in the universe is this particle and these two slits and the, and the fluorescent screen. What, what is it? The, the density matrix is presumably not some independent thing. The full, the full physical situation of this particle is given by its position. Yes, yes. The, physical position, the physical position is given by its position, but whether you take a Humean or primitive, primitive view on laws, the yeah. description of what this particle is going to do is still described by some law, and that law is some stochastic matrix. And remember how the wave function shows up. Uh, so it's going to be like in, it's going to be like, in a nomological Bohmian approach. It's going to be, going to be like in a nomological Bohmian yeah, approach. Good. So right. they're going to be kind of two nomological layers. There's going to be the density matrix and then how the, and, oh. But remember the density matrix, this is, they're unified. So the density matrix is really made out of theta, right? So wave functions and density matrices, they're, 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 they were defined using this theta matrix that gave this Hilbert space representation of the stochastic dynamics. So the wave function isn't this extra ingredient that's been added on top. You actually don't even ever need to use it. It's just a convenient tool for yeah, writing But down, the density yeah. matrix will be will have a sort of gnomic interpretation. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it'll 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 play a nomological role. It's uh -huh. a collection of your initial probabilities together, and it, it's got the time evolution wrapped up inside of it. Yeah. So okay, it, it, in a way, you can think of it as a, yeah. that helps a little. 
Um, okay, I'll have to think about the it. kind of object that I regard it as is something akin to whatever the metaphysical status is of like a Hamilton's principal function. It's a mathematical appurtenance that lets you, you know, predict things, but it's not like a physical object. You can't hold a Hamilton's principal but function. It, but it changes in time. So do Hamilton's principal functions. Uh huh. Right. Right. Okay. Good. 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 Um, good. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Um, Eric, if you can take one more question, then we'll have to quit. Um, okay. Well, then I'll, um, I'll, I'll give you the really simple, uh, really simple technical one. Sure. Um, how, uh, do, you, do you have an idea how this um, can be, <clears throat> pardon me, can be possibly extended to systems whose space space don't admit probability measures? Ah, that's a great question. And the answer is I don't yet know. Okay. I don't yet have an answer to that. Uh, all I, all, the only thing I can say at this point is, and let me, let me just, I'm not going to punt completely. I'm just going to say that, you know, um, my, my view is that when you encounter some physical system and you want to model it, inevitably you're going to do some kind of coarse graining because we don't know the ultimate constituents of reality. That coarse graining can mean making something continuous discrete. It can also mean take something discrete and pretending it's continuous. Uh, and the argument here is that that um, there's certainly enough um, uh, enough resources in this approach already through an appropriate level of course screening to model all of the real world systems that we know about. Um, once you have a Hilbert space picture for one of those systems, and you understand the Hilbert space picture to now be this mathematical appurtenance, the set of tools, you can do all kinds of things to the Hilbert space picture to simplify your story. You can, you can uh, take various limits in the Hilbert space picture. You can take thermodynamic limits. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. But as long as you're not trying to ascribe physical meaning to the Hilbert space ingredients, then it's totally fine to do that. I, I, was, th I was thinking about, um, uh, about uh, probabilistic reasoning in cosmology in particular, because ah. and, that, and, that, and there the, cor the coarse graining you're talking about actually won't solve the problem. It does not solve the problem. And my answer to questions of making sense of probability in, in like large universes, <laughs> I don't have a clue. <laughs> join, join, join the club, man. Okay. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody. We're going to have to call it quits. I'm sorry I went a little over. So stay tuned. There'll be an announcement about our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to be Wayne Mirvold, uh, who will be talking. Um, well, I'll, I'll send an announcement with all the information about that. So stay tuned. Um, it's good to see all of you. Thank you for spending this past couple of hours. And if you have follow-up questions, please let me know. I'll be happy to hear from all of you. It's great to see everybody. Be well.